Anyway, once again, I, I wanted to thank Rüdiger and uh, my Yale colleagues and Bob Schulman for uh, inviting me to this Schulman Lectures and also for trusting me that I will have something uh, relevant uh, to say for you. The best invitation that was already implied in what I said at the very beginning, the best invitations that you can get, at least for me, are those where I feel on the one hand a strong affinity with the agenda, for example, with the agenda of the Schumann Lectures this year, and on the other hand, the invitation somehow obliges you to completely rethink the frame in which you have been reflecting about the topic. And this was very much the case in our conversation on Sunday afternoon, and I wanted to start by telling you where I feel affinities with the program and uh, where I felt obliged to rethink, so we have a first setting of topics uh, that uh, I want to talk about. As I'm a decimal fetishist, I always announce I have five points, six points. Sometimes I miss one point, but basically there are five points in that sense, five points of affinity with the, what is the program of the Schulman Lectures this year, evidence, uh, and five points of obligation for me to rethink. The strong point of convergence uh, with an essay uh, that Rüdiger Kampel wrote about evidence after many years uh, of working on this concept. The strong point of affinity is that we both believe that in the time of the institutionalization Western culture of the Cartesian self-reference, so men think about themselves in the Cartesian way, in the sense of cogito. Cartesian self-reference means a self-reference where your identity, your self-reference, the ontology of being human only relies on consciousness, that this time, due to the self-reflexivity built into consciousness, built into the Cartesian self-reference, becomes the time of evidence, becomes the time where all of a sudden, sudden evidence is at stake, where all of a sudden evidence is rare, there are a few opportunities where you can claim evidence, where all of a sudden evidence um, is that which the subject feels is evident. It is no longer evidence, it's no longer inherent on the side of the world, on the side of the objects, and where all of a sudden all the stakes of producing evidence have to be reset. Now that this happens in what Rüdiger Kampe calls the time of evidence uh, between Descartes and Kant, is a strong point of affinity which we agree upon, uh, as you will see. Now, secondly, and this was something that I hadn't really understood before, it became clear to me when I was reading Rüdiger Kampe uh, that my own reflections that began with this publication, you were kind enough to mention, Production of Presence, my own reflections about the concept of presence in the last uh, decade uh, actually rely on a claim of evidence. Yeah? I associate evidence with, with, I associate presence with tangibility. So something that is present is something that you can touch. But then in reality, in reading, I realize it doesn't have to be tangibility normally. It is any immediate sensual contact that for me is a criterion for presence. When you talk about presence, you have to be able to be in a context of immediacy, essential context of immediacy that can be visual, can be auditive, can be tangible with an object, and you have to remove any obstacle between the subject and this object. So I had never quite realized uh, how much um, my own reflection on presence was based on a claim of evidence. Thirdly, um, I realized that if, as Rudiger Kamp is saying, I agree with that, uh, the possibility of evidence, the possibility of producing evidence has become rarefied ever since uh, the 18th century, uh, we are producing more and more situations of latency. Of latency, and latency has been a concept uh, I have been obsessed with over the past year. So we produce situations of latency, and I believe that situations of latency, and I will try to explain that, are situations that produce certain atmospheres, certain Stimmungen that are out of control. So the more latency you produce because you cannot transform something into evidence, 
the more you become wrapped into a certain mood, into a certain stimmung, I will come back to this point. Fourth point uh, of affinity, and I will explain those points in more detail within a few minutes, um, and this refers actually to the title of this lecture, I realize that in the present situation, and due to the progress of science, one could say that everything that ever matters, atoms, genes, um, electronic reactions, and so forth, and so forth, has become invisible, has become invisible. Nothing that seems to matter to us existentially, ontologically today, allows for this immediacy of a direct central access, adding again to this expectation that we are producing an enormous amount, an enormous dimension of latency. And finally, and this is again would be an affinity, with all self-irony uh, that one has to produce today when one talks about producing a narrative or a historical narrative, I think and I hope that I can offer you, and that is part of what I will try to do today, I think and I hope that I can produce a historical narrative that would connect this age of uh, evidence, 17th, 18th century, with our present intellectual and epistemological situation. So these were five of the many points of affinity and irritation in the positive sense that I felt uh, at our dinner. Maybe you didn't realize that we were talking about so many things that I felt at our dinner uh, on Sunday evening. Now the program uh, for my lecture today has four parts. I will start by just giving you a number of definitions and descriptions of concepts that I have been using in this introduction. I will define presence, latency, and stimmung. I mean, I'm using the word stimmung because mood is the mood atmosphere is the official uh, English translation, but it doesn't quite capture what stimmung can absorb semantically in German. And I will also talk more about the situation of invisibility. This is the opening um, part, part one. In the second part, I will try to give you the most reduced and also reshaped version of this history that would connect your age of latency, 17th, 18th century, with the present day situation. Of course, emphasizing above all the side of evidence. I mean, what is the situation of evidence? How has this developed since Kant, our situation of evidence? The third part, uh, and uh, after the publication of the Black Notebooks by Heidegger, one has to apologize in academic context for that. The third part uh, will be mostly dedicated to Heidegger. It is, I admit, and I hope you like that, an experimental part. I want to ask the question whether one can read in different ways uh, the two stages in the philosophy of Heidegger. I mean, I deeply believe that, yes, there is a Kehre, there is a turning in the philosophy of Heidegger, whether one can read in the historical context these two parts as an attempt at a philosophy of evidence. Yeah? That is maybe in a certain way my main thesis and perhaps if you find that interesting, uh, my contribution to your discussions. And finally, and not only because uh, I'm not physically coming from Stanford but I'm working at Stanford, I will end with a Silicon Valley reflection, with a reflection of whether there are affinities between the epistemological situation to whose emergence the electronic world has contributed on the one hand, and what I call, what I'm referring to, Heidegger's philosophy of evidence on the other hand. Now, this might sound very, very strange. And probably not associate Heidegger with Steve Jobs, for example. Uh, the basis uh, that I feel encourages me to do that is that in the last years of his production, it was more and more clear that Heidegger felt that if there was a site, an institutional site, where the unconcealment of being could happen, it might be technology. So Heidegger was very much on the side of technology as opposed to science. I mean, as this uh, seems to be so counterintuitive regarding Heidegger, few Heidegger specialists have ever developed that point, but I will admit that uh, I'm almost obsessed, and this is maybe part, partly due to living in Silicon Valley, to ask myself what could be 
the possibility of an unconcealment of being having to do uh, with the electronic industry. That might sound very, very strange. So maybe you have a reason to stay till the end that I can transform that into something less strange. Now, uh, let me finish the introductory part uh, by two more remarks. I would feel completely accomplished if my remarks today, which by no means can satisfy the expectation for full erudition, I mean, we'll talk about so many things, that you have to trust me that I have read the books and that I have some documentation and I could even make footnotes if necessary. And nevertheless, I would be happy if uh, these remarks would uh, intensify the obviously very intense climate of discussion that I have experienced in the first part of my contributions today. And this was a seminar with the students of the seminar on evidence uh, that uh, Rüdiger Kampe is running. So if I could contribute to the intensity of these discussions, I would be quite happy. I sometimes uh, feel uh, in the 66th year of my existence that I'm approaching uh, something, and I say this not only self-ironically, but seriously, uh, that uh, the German tradition of Germanistik has been calling Altersstil, uh, old age intellectual style. And this old age intellectual style means that you're running on a relatively high level of abstraction, as if there was not, sh not much time left to arrive at the existentially decisive discussion. So for me, uh, the third part, and especially the fourth part of the lecture, has a certain personal, but not only personal, existential urgency, and I want to arrive there. Talking about uh, arrival, as you see, I am talking from notes. It is always very difficult to predict um, how long uh, the lecture will be. I'm always saying, and it is true, that depends on you. If you look at me like you're interested, it always gets longer. Uh, if you have this kind of stone faces, uh, like you really want to be over, I speak more, more quickly. I would say plus minus uh, from this point on 45 minutes, which makes it a rather longish academic lecture. But if it is much longer or much shorter, responsibility uh, will always be with you. So I start, finally, some definitions and descriptions. Uh, and Inevitably, uh, I will come back to certain things that you could already find in, in printed form, but these are premises, so to speak. Now, whenever I talk about presence, I imply that whenever we have constituted an intentional object in the phenomenological sense, we have constituted an object in our mind. So you, for example, are constituted as an intentional object in my mind that whenever we have constituted an intentional object, we cannot help referring in two ways to it. Yeah? We have an intentional object, and as soon as we have an intentional object, we cannot help attributing meaning to it. It is impossible not to attribute meaning to an intentional object. So I see a face, and I immediately attribute male, female, I attribute colors, and so forth, and so forth. We cannot stop that. So this is what the humanities are talking about all the time. But at the same time, and this is what I want to emphasize when I talk about presence, we are also, and inevitably, in essential relationship to the intentional objects that we constitute. We are, for example, closer or further away from an intentional object. It is larger or smaller. It would appeal to our tangibility, to our visuality, and so forth and so forth. This is precisely this side, which I think has been uh, completely understudied, underaddressed in the humanities. This is the side that I'm referring to by presence. So I'm speaking presence about this. And presence, as I was saying before, when I talk something is present to me, somebody has presence seems to imply, as I was saying before, uh, this pledge for evidence, for immediacy. Yeah? If you say something is present to me, you would ideally not have any obstacle between that thing that you have constituted as an intentional object and yourself. And yourself as a subject, but also when you talk about presence, as a subject that now in a non-Cartesian way includes the body. So the point I want to make is for you to understand what I mean by presence. 
and that inevitably talking about presence implies this very specific claim. This is not the only claim one can make about evidence, but presence always implies evidence in the sense that there is an immediate relationship or a potentially immediate sensual relationship between me and this object. I could touch it, I can see it, I can hear it, etc. Secondly, it is the desire for evidence in the sense of presence that produces situations of latency and coming from uh, presence, I have been uh, obsessed with the concept of latency for quite some time. Let me describe uh, what I understand by situations of latency. These are situations where we have, for whichever reason, certainty that a potential intentional object is there there, but secondly, we do not know where it is, nor do we know the identity of this object. We do not know what it is. We feel something is there when we talk about latency. And that means, thirdly, uh, if what is the potential um, object of presence that is latent, if it shows itself, we would not necessarily know that this is what has been latent all the time. And this is why uh, my colleague, uh, the Dutch theorist of history, El Corunia, uses the metaphor of the stowaway for latency. Yeah? The latent object is like a stowaway. Think of Titanic, for example, when all of a sudden Leo DiCaprio presents himself at the celebration on the ship, and nobody knows that he's the stowaway, that nobody knows that he was the one who was latent. In the fourth place, Latency is not identical with a Freudian situation of repression with the subconscious. Because I think the Freudian concept of the subconscious and of repression always comes with the promise that in the end, that which was suppressed can be identified. Yeah? Situations of latency often continue to be situations of latency and this epiphanic moment of what is latent showing itself does not happen. But above all, uh, I'm convinced that situations of latency have the potential, not the necessity, to produce certain atmospheres, certain Stimmungen. Now, how do I define atmosphere? How do I define Stimmung? I define atmosphere by saying it is the lightest physical touch of the material environment of your body that you can imagine. This is why I think we associate atmospheres, Stimmungen, moods uh, with the weather. Yeah, that would be the lightest physical touch. We know that according to the weather we are in a different mind frame or also with music. Yeah, this is what you associate. So seemingly the situations of latency produce certain Stimmungen produce certain Stimmungen, and maybe it is those Stimmungen who give us the certainty that there is something there, there, that we cannot identify. The most beautiful description of uh, latency and Stimmung that I've ever read is by Toni Morrison. It's one sentence in, in, in jazz, and she describes atmosphere, she says. It is like being touched from inside. Yeah? I think this... Uh, paradoxical formulation describes beautifully that this is a physical touch that triggers a certain psychic situation, a certain uh, mind frame. Um, so if we produce much latency by not being able to transform the intuition about something being there, there into evidence, then we also produce certain Stimmungen. And this, is this clear to you, what I'm trying to explain here? This will be important in my development. Finally, uh, I think we can say that uh, on the science side, due to this completely unbelievable success story of the natural sciences over the past two centuries, uh, we can say that today we find ourselves in a situation of latency of unprecedented dimensions. Because I would say practically everything that matters to us, physically above all, but also existentially, are things that 
are latent and cannot be transformed into visibility, into evidence, into this immediacy of central contact. Uh, think about atoms, think about genes. I would like to distinguish three such different dimensions. I think what is the most obvious are things that are simply too small. Yeah? I mean, of course, you can have visualization, but uh, of course you have microscopes, but then there are things that matter to us that are way beyond the power of microscopes. I mean, not only atoms think, for example, of viruses. I and mean, we know they exist, we can describe them, but there is no way of transforming them into evidence in my sense. On the other things, on the other hand, things can be invisible in that sense, not evident because they are too large. Yeah? Think only of our galaxy, think of the universe, or think about uh, the imagination that there might be multiple, maybe an endless number of universes. That seems to be too large and too complex to ever transform that into a uh, situation of evidence, into a situation of presence, into a situation of visibility. And then finally, I think uh, there are certain relationships above all that we can describe mathematically, but for which we cannot even imagine a dimension of evidence in the sense that I've described. Think only of causality. So how would you visualize, how would you transform causality in something sensually evident. Or think, for example, about what is going on in a computer chip. We can describe what the chip is doing, uh, but we can never really plausibly illustrate what is going on in a computer chip. And uh, I will end up talking about that. So uh, I hope that at this point, uh, even if you have never read a line of what I've been publishing, which may be the better side of living. Uh, you have an impression now what I mean when I say presence and why presence has to do with evidence. What I mean when I talk about latency and Stimmung and why they are related and why the title of this lecture uh, is All That Matters is Invisible. We are in this situation that everything that matters, especially but not exclusively for our physical life, cannot be transformed into uh, evidence into immediate evidence. Now this brings me to the second part in which as promised and as a frame narrative uh, I will try to connect uh, what Rüdiger Kampe has been calling the age of evidence, 17th, 18th century, when evidence all of a sudden becomes a problem when there's a shortage of evidence and our present uh, situation. I mean, if you ever are interested in knowing more about this very reduced narrative that I will present you in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, one book that Rüdiger has kindly mentioned, uh, After 1945, Latency as Origin of the Present, and another book that first appeared in German and is now forthcoming at uh, Columbia University Press, Our Broad Present, would be the two references where you can have many more arguments and many more illustrations uh, of what I mean. Now, the story I want to tell you, knowing, of course, that stories are problematic. I mean, as all humanists, I have read that, and nevertheless, I will present you a story. Let's say the story is a form of organization. The story relies on a concept that you may find strange or that you may find familiar, and this is the concept of chronotope. Now, the concept of chronotope was introduced by the Russian thinker, humanist, um, Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin, but I actually only borrow the signifier. I borrow the word chronotope, but I do not associate it with the meaning that Bakhtin gives to this word, I mean chronos and topos. So for Bakhtin, when he talks about chronotopes, he tries to describe certain configurations in which time and space are brought together. I use the word chronotope in a much more simple sense. I say chronotope for social construction of temporality, and I admit uh, that I use the word chronotope as a totalizing concept to describe large historical situations. Why do I use um, social constructions of temporality in a totalizing view? Well, my argument would be Husserl. Husserl describes time as the structure, as the form of experience. 
And if we can say that the historically changing structures of time will always impact any experience that we are making in a certain historical situation, then we could say as soon as we can identify what is historically specific about a construction of time, construction of temporality, then we have a premise that would impact, that would inform any individual experience that we are making. So this just explains why I'm using this concept of chronotope in the sense of social construction of temporality, but I'm using this concept of chronotopes to describe larger frames of mind, if you want larger epistemological configurations that do characterize certain historical moments. Now my story, as you will see, is a story of two or three chronotopes. That sounds very strange, but let me begin by uh, describing the emergence of the chronotope between 1780 and 1830, of the chronotope that has dominated for 200 years, Western thinking, and this is what I would like to call the historicist chronotope. In German, I would say historisches Weltbild. And as you will recognize, no doubt, what I have to say there is not just a summary, but is strongly informed and influenced both by Michel Foucault, above all, Les Mots et les Choses, The Order of Things, but also by the life world of uh, the German historian. I think he was much more than a historian for me. He's the most important academic humanist in Germany in the second half of the 20th century. I say that for the Germanists as a provocation, and this is uh, Reinhard Koselleck, who is still much underestimated internationally. So this is exactly where I connect now with Rüdiger's intuition uh, that in the age of evidence, due to self-reflexivity, Cartesian self-reflexivity, um, something is happening epistemologically, evidence becomes a problem. My starting point, I think this is, I mean, if you remember your article, at the end of your article, my starting point uh, would be a moment where the Cartesian world observer, so the subject, the outside observer, consciousness observes the world of objects, where the Cartesian uh, world observer becomes a second order observer, becomes a self-reflexive observer. Now you might say that is inherent to human consciousness. Human consciousness is always self-reflexive. I mean, Plato was ob obviously self-reflexive. Think of Montaigne. So the historical difference is that from the late 18th century on, there was a group of people, then called les philosophes, we would call them to no now intellectuals, for whom self-observation in the act of world observation becomes habitual. So you cannot be an intellectual, you cannot observe the world without observing yourself in the act of world observation. Is that clear? This is historically new, that this becomes habitual for a certain group of people. Now this habitualization of self-observation, of second-order observation, has two consequences. A second-order observer discovers that whatever world observation he's making depends on his or her point of view so that potentially, as there's an infinity of point of views, a potential infinity of point of views, for each object of reference, you have an infinity of representations. And this produces in the late 18th century, and I think this is something that could be amply documented, what I like to call metaphorically an epistemological horror vacui. And people begin to think, well, if there's a potential infinity of point of views for each object of reference, maybe there is no self-identical object of reference. I think, I mean, this is for the Germanists, that this is precisely what shocked Heinrich von Kleist so much when he got into the first pages of Kant's critical thinking, the Kant Krise, that Kleist, somebody so concentrated on the reference in the linguistic sense, all of a sudden feared that there might not be self-identical, a self-identical world of objects. So this is the first crisis you may call that perspectivism, and perspectivism related to this epistemological horror vacui. But a second order observer, an observer who observes herself in the, w in the act of world observation, also discovers that there are basically two modalities of world appropriation. World appropriation by concepts, what we normally call experience, and on the other hand, world appropriation by the body, through the senses, what Descartes didn't talk about, what we phenomenologically call perception. 
And the second question that comes up uh, in the late 18th century obsessively is the question whether one can, and if so, how one can compatibilize world appropriation through the senses, perception on the one hand, and world appropriation uh, through concepts, experience on the other hand. Now, in the emergence of the historicist worldview, and this is very important, the second question, the question about a possible relationship between perception, sensual perception, experience, gets bracketed, gets eliminated. And I would therefore say that in the sense of evidence that I have introduced, in the emergence of the historical worldview, in the emergence of the historicist worldview, this dimension of evidence gets eliminated. Yeah? It really does not appear outside the sciences until uh, the late 20th, early 21st century. The other problem, however, uh, the problem of polyperspectivism and the epistemological horror vacui finds a solution in a short time that is unbelievably successful, and that is a shift from a mirror-like principle of world representation. So for each object, you have one representation. That would be the principle of the 18th century encyclopedias to a narrative pattern of world representation. You can observe that from the early 19th century on, when you're being asked what is France or what is Yale, you have to tell the history of Yale. And if you're being asked, this would be evolutionism, what is an ant, you have to tell the evolutionary history of the ant. And if you're being asked what is the spirit, you have to be young Hegel and have to write the phenomenology of the spirit, which for those of you who have read it know, is a narrative. Now why is a narrative a solution to polyperspectivism? Because I think a narrative as a discourse allows you to absorb all the potentially different perspectives of an object and thereby neutralizes the problem of polyperspectivism. Is that clear? So you could say that um, due to what Michel Foucault in Les Mots de calls historisation des êtres, historicization of things, which becomes a general movement, uh, around 1830, all of a sudden, this problem of polyperspectivism doesn't exist anymore. The epistemological horror vacui doesn't exist anymore. And the other problem, the problem of evidence, of compatibility between perception and experience is eliminated. Um, this solution through historicization to, 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 to solve the problem of polyperspectivism through historicization becomes the basis of what we have been calling ever since the historicist worldview. And the historicist worldview, and I'm largely relying on Kozelek here, can be described by five features. You can say that the, I mean, you will find this is just how we experience time, but this is due to the fact that this specific construction of time was so heavily institutionalized. So it is the temporality in which we believe that uh, we always have to leave the past behind ourselves. Only if we can leave the past behind ourselves, we can move on to the future. In which we secondly think that on the other hand, the future is an open horizon of possibilities from which we can choose. In which we thirdly think that between that past we leave behind ourselves and that future that's an open horizon of possibility, presence is reduced, and I'm quoting Baudelaire, to an imperceptibly short moment of transition. And in the fourth place, and I think this is decisive, this present, not presence, present, as an imperceptibly short moment of transition becomes the habitat, the place, the epistemological place of the Cartesian subject. It is in the present that adapting experience from the past to the present, the subject chooses among the possibility of the future. This is what we call agency, this is what we call handeln, and this is the central self-reference of modernity. Yeah, that based on experience from the past, in the present, you can choose among the possibilities of the future. This is also, for example, what we call politics. But the point I want to make is that this self-conception, which excludes the body, which is purely Cartesian, is specific to the historicist chronotrope. And finally, 
the historicist chronotope, the historische, das historische Weltbild, implies that time is a necessary agent of change, that there are no phenomena that can resist transformation in time. Now, the point I want to make is that by 1830, this historicist worldview is so strongly and so quickly institutionalized that it becomes the basis both of Hegelian philosophy of history and for Darwinian evolutionism. They both need the historicist worldview. But it also becomes the basis for socialism that emerges in that time long before Marx, but also, on the other hand, practically speaking, for capitalism. Capitalism cannot exist without future as an open horizon of possibilities, of, as a horizon of growth. So that, um, for the past 200 years, I think, in Western culture, we have had a tendency to confuse the historicist worldview as a worldview that specifically establishes itself between 1780 and 1830 with time in and by itself. And this is why, perhaps, listening to me, you may have thought, well, he's <coughs> describing time at large, not time in a historically specific way. But I want to insist that this is specific. OK? Now, my second point is that, so to speak, beside the establishment of the historicist worldview uh, that also produces the concept of enlightenment. The concept of enlightenment is a view of the 18th century seen through the historicist worldview. So everything that fits the historicist worldview becomes enlightenment. That beside this concept, there was an intellectual configuration in the 18th century that I would like to call uh, prose of the world that is, so to speak, an alternative, that is a different worldview. I call it prose of the world because I associate this worldview, and this is the book that I'm writing at present, with the French philosopher Denis Diderot, the editor of the Encyclopedia, with people like Goya, like Lichtenberg, like Mozart, they will be uh, the heroes uh, of the book that I'm writing at present, Prose of the World, Diderot, Goya, Lichtenberg, Mozart will probably be the title. And what I'm saying is that these protagonists, for some reasons, do not, I mean, we somehow subsume them under 18th century enlightenment, but they do not fit like Kant or Hume would fit, or Hegel would fit, into our conception of enlightenment. And this is the reason why, strangely, Hegel, who is so central for the historicist worldview, is absolutely obsessed with Diderot. Yes? Diderot comes up about 30 times in Hegel's work, and one out of two times when he speaks about Hegel, he uses this word, prose of the world, this concept. Prose of the world, therefore, stands here for the other world. Now, how can we describe, by contrast, this prose of the world worldview? In the first place, in the prose of the world worldview, this problem of perspectivism is not neutralized. Yeah? In the prose of the world worldview, and for those among you who know Diderot, proof being his novel Jacques le Fataliste, uh, we have a worldview that is best described by the German word contingence, that is semantically similar but slightly different from the English word contingency. That means the world presents itself as a collection of objects for which all you can have different perspectives. Yeah? So everything has a polyperspectivism except for that which is absolutely necessary in the Hegelian sense on the one side and that which is impossible on the other side. But different from the historicist worldview where everything is transformed into necessity, so to speak, into narrative necessity, and where thereby uh, your take on the world is a, w is a hermeneutic one, one of understanding. You will always try to find histories that explain why necessarily the present had to be what it is like, why necessarily certain things have to develop. In the prose of the world worldview, uh, you have this openness of possibilities, this openness of perspectives. In the second place, in a prose of the world worldview, uh, this question of a compatibilization between perception and experience is not neutralized. So in the prose of the world worldview, the desire for evidence, for example, survives. A desire for evidence survives, proof being uh, 
in the works of Diderot, his obsessive writing about blindness and about deafness. Yeah? There's Lettres sur les, sur les aveugles, Lettres sur les sous, and he always tries to prove that even if you have lost one sense, you can still have a situation of evidence with the world. So this insistence of evidence has completely disappeared, which, which also exists very strongly <coughs> in Lichtenberg, especially in the Zudelbücher, has completely disappeared and the historicist worldview is present here. And finally, and uh, this is what I'm most interested in, in prose of the world, uh, the human self-reference is not a self-reference in the Cartesian sense not a self-reference in the sense of you are human because you are consciousness and nothing but consciousness. It is a strongly embodied worldview, as I think Diderot has most convincingly described it uh, in this character of one of his later book manuscripts, Le Neveu de Rameau, Rameau's nephew. Rameau's nephew, who in this book is in a dialogue with the philosoph, with the philosopher. The philosopher would be very much Cartesian. I mean, he doesn't really have a body, he doesn't need a body, he just speaks. He just has his intelligence. But this Rameau is somebody about whom Diderot immediately writes, he always speaks either too loud, he smells very strongly. I mean, given the uh, uh, 18th century hygiene standards to, Im to imagine somebody who would smell aggressively by 18th century standards had to be quite a lot. And very interestingly, Diderot emphasizes that um, the relationship of the Neveu de Rameau, Rameau's nephew, to the world of objects is a relationship of copying. He says he is somebody who can copy all voices. He all of a sudden, in a conversation with the philosophe, the book describes that all of a sudden he was talking like the philosophe, he was gesticulating like the philosophe, he was embodying the philosophe. You see, this is not uh, a relationship to the world of objects that functions by interpretation. You are outside and you interpret the world, you attribute meaning to the world, you explain how the world emerged the way it did. It is a relationship that is a physical relationship. You relate to the world that surrounds you by embodying that world, by copying that world. So see uh, that there is in the 18th century, not canonized as part of enlightenment, an epistemological configuration that I'm very interested in, in which due to contingency the problem and the desire of evidence is preserved, in which uh, the question of perception and experience is not eliminated, and in which the relationship to the physical world is a relationship of embodiment, of empathy, including the physical sense. Is that clear, at least as a broad description? Yeah? So I'm not talking about repression, I'm not talking um, about marginalization. Uh, I think uh, philosophers like Diderot, protagonists like Lichtenberg, uh, Mozart, uh, Goya, have been fascinating throughout the 19th and 20th century, but they were never centrally canonized. They're always there as a possibility but it is clear that, for example, for Diderot in the French reception history, there has never been a moment of canonization. Now, and this is, so to speak, my third chronotope. If we can say that throughout the 19th century and during much of the 20th century, the centrally established chronotope and worldview was the historicist worldview, as I have described it, I think we can observe, and this is the main topic of this book after 1945, that since the mid-20th century, another chronotope has been emerging, and I would like to call it the chronotope of the broad present, the chronotope of the broad present, that has become in our present not the successor of the historicist worldview, but an alternative to the historicist worldview. Let me very briefly describe um, uh, our broad present. And if you try, because I'm claiming this has something to do with the present, early 21st century, uh, 
uh, just uh, try to see whether you have these perspectives in your everyday view. So I believe that our everyday today is dominated much more by the chronotope of the broad present than by the historicist chronotope. I think that in history departments and humanities seminars, when we do politics, if we do politics at all, we have preserved the historicist worldview, but that our everyday is dominated by this other chronotope, by this other worldview. So I think, for example, that for us in our everyday, the future largely and predominantly is no longer an open horizon of possibilities from which we can choose, but a future that is occupied by threats that move towards us. Think global warming, for example, think the exhaustion of resources, think of the demographic situation. Whether this is justified that we are so worried about that or not is not the question. I don't have the competence to decide that. But I think this is what we really associate with the future today. And so it has become a future of survival. Yeah? How long will humankind be able to survive certain challenges? Once again, I'm not making a political statement that this is uh, ecologically correct, yes, I believe it is, but that doesn't really matter. I'm just describing a certain frame of mind. Secondly, I believe that in our everyday, we are no longer in a situation where we leave the past behind and that we have sometimes been obsessed with a loss of the past. I think we are in a situation where not exclusively but partly due to the electronic capacity of storage our present is inundated by pastness. So I would say at any given moment we have too much past, too much pastness <laughs> available. That doesn't mean that we are all uh, historically cultivated, but there's just too much material. I mean, rumor has it uh, that no email you will ever write will ever be completely erased. So imagine that accumulation. And this means thirdly that between that blocked future and that past that inundates our present, our present is no longer a imperceptibly short moment of transition, but an ever broadening present of simultaneities. So everything that has ever existed in the past is present, simultaneously present in our present. Now, if, and this was my point in the description of the historicist chronotope, if in the historicist chronotope we have associated the predominant Cartesian self-reference without a body with this imperceptibly short present, and if we have now an ever-broadening present, I think this makes it plausible why both philosophically and in our everyday for the past decades we have been so desperately trying to bring back the soma into philosophical forms of self-reference, uh, recuperating the body. But why this has also, think about jogging, think about fitness studios and so forth, been so important in our everydayness. So I think in the chronotope of the broad press, we're trying to bring the soma, the sensual relationship to the world. And also with that, the concern of evidence, the desire of evidence comes back into the picture. And finally, if in the historicist chronotope, if in the historicist chronotope, uh, um, if in the historicist chronotope, it was impossible to imagine an open, it, it was possibly necessary to imagine an open future. We don't have this open future anymore. Now, let me make three commentaries on this history of uh, two or three chronotopes that tries to connect the age of evidence with our present situation. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that there is an affinity between the pros of the world situation, Diderot above all, uh, um, Diderot, Mozart, Lichtenberg, Goya on the one hand, and uh, the chronotope of the broad present. Yeah? I'm not saying that there's a genealogical relation, I just have I'm not at this point to work out. I think there's an affinity. And this affinity may explain why Diderot and why a figure like this Rameau's nephew is fascinating uh, for us uh, today. Secondly, and this is very important, it is in the logic of the new chronotope 
ever-broadening present of simultaneities that it does not eliminate the previous chronotope, but that, of course, it will make the previous chronotope, the historicist chronotope, part of this broad present of simultaneities. This is why I believe we are in a situation where in some everyday situations we are on the historicist chronotope. For example, the, in humanities, the historicist chronotope is still strongly institutionalized, whereas in our everyday life, when, you know, even if you think about finances and so forth, we hardly ever move in a chronotope that is not the chronotope of uh, the broadening present. But above all, I wanted to emphasize that it is this emergence of the chronotope of the broad present, in which all of a sudden the human self-reference is no longer Cartesian self-reference, but tries to integrate body, present, and immediacy, evidence comes back. And with it, a desire for evidence comes back. So this is why I think, I think this narrative can connect your description of the age of evidence with the present situation. And if you make the French distinction uh, between amont and aval, so you climb, and then you have the second half uh, of the lecture or the second half of the walk going down. Now we are on the aval part. I start part three and four, and um, I think it will take me another 15 minutes to finish, if that's okay with you. What can you say? Nobody is nodding, uh, but I will do it anyway, I mean, <laughs> brutally. Okay. Now. My third question is whether in this context we can talk about Heidegger's philosophy, or more precisely speaking about the two stages in Heidegger's philosophy as a philosophy of evidence. And of course, I will try to show that this is a possibility. Uh, let me talk about the precondition. In the established historicist worldview, as it dominated throughout the 19th century and the early 20th century, there was an ontological hiatus between the human self-reference, purely spiritual, purely Cartesian, and the world of objects, on the other hand. And I think that produced this impression, this is the philosophical fascination, obsession of the 19th century, not only that there is no possibility for evidence, but this impression of a growing divergence between subject and object. Yeah? And this leads, in the early 19th century, especially in the work of uh, Bergson and Edmund Husserl, to a concentration on the human mind. So if we can concentrate on the human mind, we can exactly show how the human mind works. Then perhaps we can bridge this gap between human self-reference and the world of objects. But what ultimately Husserl's philosophy, and this was not Husserl's intention, leads to in the middle, mid 20th century, second half of the 20th century, is what has been called pragmatism or what we call constructivism. Namely, to the idea that we don't have to produce evidence. It is enough if we produce, based on the human mind, a worldview on which we can all agree. So if we can agree on how we construct the world, that is good enough. And you realize, I mean, once uh, you move in constructivism, then the question of evidence, of immediacy of evidence, of physical, sensual evidence, is completely eliminated. Is that clear? So, I mean, with the dominance of constructivism, I would say mid-20th century, think uh, uh, of American pragmatism, the, word, the work of my much admired and beloved late Stanford colleague Richard Rorty. Think of the second Wittgenstein, the Wittgenstein uh, uh, of philosophical reflections. Um, think of Niklas Luhmann from the German side. So this is the dominance of the constructivist worldview. Now in constructivist worldview, there's absolutely uh, no question of evidence. But at the same time, there is a desire for evidence. And my thesis is that from his early work on, and perhaps specifically as a student and assistant in the German system, of Edmund Husserl, Heidegger early on, uh, from being in time on, tries to invent a philosophy where this gap between subject and object is minimized. I think the two decisive uh, 
definitional moves in being in time by Heidegger is A, the substitution of subject, the word subject does not appear in being in time from 1927, through the concept of Dasein. And this is not just synonymous. Through the spatial particle da, Heidegger re-includes the body in the human self-reference. Eh? I mean, space is that which constitutes itself around the body. So Dasein includes the somatic side of human existence. And at the same time, Heidegger does not use the subject-object paradigm outside observer of the world, but with obsessive hyphenations, the paradigm of being in the world. Huh? The subject-object relationship is replaced by the concept of being in the world. So you want to bring these two sides together. Now, being in the world, and this is another distinction, key distinction Heidegger is making uh, in being and time. Being in the world is a relation where the world is ready to hand ready to hand, meaning you're always already in a situation where you know what to do with the world, that is the ready to hand, as opposed to present at hand, the world is in front of you and you have to interpret the world. That would be the subject-object paradigm that Heidegger wants to eliminate. What Heidegger does not realize at this point, I mean this is my interpretation, is that through this emphasis on being in the world hyphenated and the ready to hand, you're always already familiar with the world. Um, the dimension, the problem of evidence is eliminated, does not exist because you're always already familiar with the world. There is no desire of evidence. And thereby, I think, uh, the existential ontology of being and time ultimately will lead into another type of constructivism. Uh, this is why American pragmatists like Richard Rorty uh, uh, were so much in favor of the early Heidegger and could absolutely not stand the later Heidegger. Uh, this is why there is without any doubt uh, an, onto an epistemological affinity uh, between the early Heidegger and the late Wittgenstein. But the point I want to make now is that um, Heidegger's philosophy after the Kehre after the turning is a philosophy that tries against the trend of being in time, uh, that tries to bring in the dimension of evidence, that tries to bring in the dimension of evidence. And I think what is perhaps the starting point of that is Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche and Heidegger's identification of Nietzsche's concept of nihilism precisely with what we today would call constructivism. I think, I mean, I cannot prove that my thesis would be what Heidegger, based on Nietzsche, describes and criticizes of nihilism is a worldview that depends absolutely on the human projection, on the human interpretation that does not allow from an evidence that comes from outside. In this sense, it is interesting that in the mid-1930s, uh, Heidegger writes this very important, very long lecture that is a critique of modern natural science, a critique of modern science, the age of the world picture. And he criticizes modern science, Newtonian science, by saying, and I think the metaphor is precious, that what modern science has done is to establish a curtain of mathematics, a curtain of mathematics between Dasein on the one side and nature on the other side. There is no evidence that we, I mean, all we can see is invisible. There is no evidence that ever connects us to what is outside ourselves but mathematics. I mean, that will help us uh, to dispose of nature in any way, but there is no dimension of evidence. Do you get the point of nature? I therefore believe uh, that Heidegger's post kehre philosophy, starting, I think, with introductions to metaphysics, uh, a lecturing course from 1934-1935, becomes a philosophy of evidence, becomes the attempt at a philosophy of evidence. The central concept is being, capital B, that hardly appears in being and time, and unconceivement of being, Selbstentbergung des Seins. And I believe that the concept of being, capital B for Heidegger,
is actually exactly the concept that was surrounded by a taboo ever since Kant, das Ding an sich, the thing in and by itself. I think when Heidegger talks about being, he talks about something substantial, something material. He talks in the second place about something that is singular individual. He doesn't talk about things <coughs> in general. And he thirdly, the unconcealment of being would be the possibility of experiencing an object in its immediacy without a plurality of perspectives coming in between. It would be this desire, I think, the description of the situation of truth as an unconcealment of being would be this <coughs> desire of immediacy. Yeah? Something shows itself to you as if you could see it, and sometimes we have this illusion for a short moment, as if we could see it, as if we could perceive it without perspective. So it would not be glasses in general, but these individual glasses in their substantiality, if there was a way of not seeing it from your perspective, from your perspective, from my perspective, but absolutely, so to speak, without any uh, perspective. Now let me emphasize uh, that this precisely is my description of Heidegger's late philosophy as a philosophy of evidence. Now, it is interesting uh, to see what could be then the human contribution. You see the initiatives on the side of being. Yeah? It is being that unconceals itself. What can we contribute? Well, he says we can contribute above all that we don't press too much. Uh, if you press too much, if you want to investigate too much, you push things, you push being back, so to speak. So we should be there in Gelassenheit, in serenity. I mean, he makes this implication that being does not unconceal itself without Dasein being present, but Dasein should not be active. We have to be there as a catalyst for it to happen, but we should not investigate. Uh, and in this context, this is also interesting, uh, this is when Heidegger in the 1930s says for the first time that perhaps science will certainly not achieve it because science always establishes this curtain of mathematics. But perhaps engineering, which has a present-to-hand relationship to the world, always a practical relationship to the world, that could perhaps be the side where being unconceals itself. I mean, there's a passage uh, in a lecturing course from 1952 where it says, for example, uh, to read Einstein will not help you in the sense of an unconcealment of the being of energy. But if one would be able to sit, what he implies to be a military airplane, I mean, today you would say Eurofighter, F-23 or further, that would give you an unconcealment, the beginning of an unconcealment of energy, which I found relatively plausible, hopefully not only because my oldest son is an Air Force, pi Air Force pilot. Now, after World War II, in the first text that Heidegger writes, uh, after World War II, after the collapse of the Nazi empire, into which, as you all know, he had made quite a serious existential investment, the first text is the letter of humanism in 1948, and that text brings a new dimension in this philosophy of evidence. For me, the key passage in the letter of humanism is where Heidegger says, why did we always think that Dasein, the human cognitive apparatus, was adequate to receive and embrace being that unconceals itself. It could be that there is a complete inadequacy. We always assume that if we only do the right thing, we will understand everything that surrounds us. But what if there was a disproportion between Dasein on the one side and the complexity of being that could unconceal itself? And that, of course, uh, would mean, on th in the first place, that there would be enormous situations of latency. We do not find the right angle for being to unconceal itself. It also means that we could imagine situations where the unconcealment of being, and think of something physical, would become uh, what Heidegger calls destiny, geschick, would really overwhelm us. Yeah? Being unconceals itself, and by unconcealing itself, would destroy us. I mean, uh, 
you could imagine scenarios where a nuclear war would be such a situation of unconcealment of itself, but we could not control it. It uh, would completely destroy us. And I think this accompanies Heidegger till the end uh, of his philosophy. I mean, there's this famous posthumous interview in which he says, only a God can help us. And some people have interpreted that in the sense, in a theological meaning. No, I don't think it's theological. I think this is an exclamation of being desperate, of despair. I mean, there's a hope that the unconceivement of being might happen in technology, but we somehow cannot find the right angle. And as we cannot find the right angle, there is this accumulation of that which remains invisible, a situation that is more and more threatening, a situation that is more and more threatening in the sense that being might unconceive itself as destiny and might completely uh, destroy humankind. So the point I want to make here is that this situation of latency produces a stimmung, and I do think it is a stimmung that is typical for our cultural moment, where our relationship to humankind is more and more a relationship of concern for survival. Concern for survival. How long can we survive? Yeah? I mean, I think if you compare literature, I mean, even literature in the primary sense of the world, not only philosophy, uh, these scenarios of survival, these scenarios of how long can we overcome have completely replaced what used to be a utopian moment. This brings me to my final and uh, brief reflection, so to speak, Heidegger and Silicon Valley. And I think you understand at this point what the relationship would be, namely, and it is a serious and obsessive relationship for me. Instead uh, of um, self-flagellating ourselves for Silicon Valley, I mean, American intellectuals are very good at self-flagellating, so we feel guilty of having invented Silicon Valley due to the donations of Silicon Valley. I cannot do that as a Stanford professor anyway. Um, I'm also not terribly interested in NSA. I find it quite horrible, but it is not an intellectually interesting problem, really. I mean, yes, everything we write can be surveilled. This is very, very bad, but I don't see where the intellectual challenge lies. I mean, my obsess, my o I mean, there's a political challenge, but not an intellectual challenge. I'm really interested, and this is what I want to dedicate the last five minutes to, in this question whether a technology that Heidegger could, of course, not imagine, namely the electronic technology, has a potential f to, be, to become the site of unconcealment of being, uh, has a potential of producing a type of evidence uh, that we have never seen, but that could ultimately satisfy this desire for evidence as a rarefied product that has been existing since the late 18th century. Now, instead of an early intellectual attitude towards computers, where the screen of the computer and the program only added to the mathematical curtain between the subject uh, and nature. For those among you uh, who are Germanists, this is what the early Friedrich Kittler, I mean, the inventor of media studies, does in his work. I mean, so lots of mathematics, but in the sense there is no immediacy. I mean, this is not a thinking about electronics immediacy. I would say that we can claim that, and I'm using these two names emblematically, with Steve Jobs, and with Apple, with the Apple screen, with the mouse, and so forth and so forth, electronic technology has become, in the literal sense of the word, ready to hand. Uh, electronic technology has become uh, ready to hand, and by being so ready to hand, has produced the impression of being able to hold the world in your hand. I mean, I think this is more than a metaphor. I mean, I don't possess a cell phone. I must be the only person in Silicon Valley who doesn't possess one. But if you have, you know, an iPad 5 or whatever, you really, in a certain way, hold the world in your hand. I think 
this paradigm of technology also has produced an impression of immediacy in communication. Think of the social media, think of communicating by email in real time. So I think all of a sudden, within uh, the Steve Jobs, Apple paradigm, and this I do believe is the cultural importance of Jobs as a figure, has produced this impression of immediacy. But at the same time, I would say what it has ultimately produced is a new version of constructivism. Yeah? I think that in the social media, in the Apple type of communication, doesn't have to be Apple, uh, we function again in a not so much social, but technological construction of reality. And ultimately, this is a soft construction of reality that does not allow for any evidence. Yeah? Where would be the outside object between which and with which you want to establish a situation of sensual immediacy? So I think it is interesting to think from this perspective, is there something like an unconcealment of being in this type of development of the electronic industry, my answer would be no without criticizing it. I would rather say we could say that the Apple Jobs version of electronic technology has become the early 21st century replacement of pragmatics, replacement um, of constructivism. Now, and with this I will really finish, the latest Silicon Valley obsession as some of you know, and I'm certain some or most of you know more about it than I do, are quantum computers. And maybe quantum computers is a different dimension. Quantum computers, and there are only few of them existing today, between five or ten I hear, and Stanford has so far refused to buy one. USC has bought one now. So this is USC's hope to, uh, after that they now lose against us in football, uh, that they can beat us academically, which I think will not happen. Anyway, quantum computers are characterized um, by an enormous increase of computing capacity. And this uh, enormous increase of computing capacity has to do with a different chip. Quantum computers have chips that are no longer binary. There are chips that produce in a way, and I could not reproduce that, I trust the people who write about that. There are chips uh, whose structural functioning is closer to the functioning of the human brain. So it is no longer exclusively binary. One could say that on the technological side, this is a movement similar to Heidegger's replacing subject, the Cartesian subject by Dasein. So you produce a hardware, so to speak, that is closer to the functioning <coughs> of the human self-reference in the somatic dimension. Now, the promise of quantum computers is that within a few years, and thanks to their increased computing capacity, Quantum computers will solve three questions. I mean, this is the promise. Whether it will happen, we don't know yet. And I cannot judge. The first promise is it will finally explain us how the mind functions based on the brain, maybe due to its own similarity to this construction. Secondly, Unbelievably as this sounds, but these are serious promises discussed today at Google, but also in our computer science department, without any doubt in your computer science department. They will provide an answer to the question whether there's anything similar to human intelligence in the universe. And uh, it thirdly promises to give an answer to the question of whether there's but one universe, but a plurality, maybe even an <coughs> infinity of coexisting universes. Now, if one makes the effort to imagine that we would ever be in a situation where all these questions are answered, these are not all existing questions, but where these questions are answered, <coughs> 
a large part of what today is invisible, of what is latency, would have been transformed into evidence. So we would have a different situation of evidence. Whether this would be a situation of evidence that implies presence in the sense of sensual immediacy is something, and I apologize, that goes beyond my imagination. But I do think that it is worth uh, thinking about the present day technological situation and the technological future from the perspective of Heidegger's philosophy as an attempt as a philosophy of evidence. This has gotten much longer than anticipated, and I therefore thank you so much and so intentionally for your attention. Um, yeah, I was going to thank you for a, a method which I have a lot of affinity with, that is the, the affinity method of doing intellectual history. I see these <coughs> relationships, and I, they really illuminate a lot for me. When you turn to Heidegger, I, I had a question, and I'm not sure whether your terms, presence and latency, relate to, have an affinity with deconcealment and concealment or not. They want to. Yeah. They want oh, to. Oh, I want to. <laughs> um, you, when, you, uh, when you talk about unconcealment, first of all, you have a great emphasis on unconcealment and very little on concealment. Mm -hmm. And for Heidegger, it really is a dualism, and the concealed is much, much bigger mm -hmm. than the deconcealed. The Lichtung is mm -hmm. what just True. manages yeah. to push back. Um, and I mention that because it seems like um, when you talk about the hope for unconcealment in technology, Heidegger didn't hope that there would be a kind of revelation of being, finally, once and for all, that would be present. What he was hoping for, I think, and this made him suspicious of certain types of technology, was that this um, underlying structure of the exchange of unconcealment and concealment, their mutual dependency, the fact that there's always a lot that's latent, really, in reality, so one could never say this is it, that the there that's there is really there, um, that um, he doesn't hope for any kind of unconcealment. He only hopes that this structure will become the way we think about the way history moves. You understand? I understand, but I disagree. <laughs> no, is but that, that doesn't mean that you are wrong. I'm just saying, uh, let, let's, uh, let's explain where we agree and where we disagree, and then maybe we agree to disagree. Um, uh, I mean, perhaps we agree, I mean, that seemed to be implied, um, that there is a certain impulse towards something like a philosophy of evidence in Heidegger. Uh, I would say, especially in the not late Heidegger, second part of Heidegger, um, that a terminology like unconcealment of being, being capital B, uh, described as situation of truth, uh, I do think um, tries to go beyond or to bypass or to undercut uh, what around these early 30s, if you think of the early Alfred Schütz and so forth and so forth, become the consequence of phenomenology, namely the beginning of what later on we call constructivism. Yeah? I mean, this is, uh, this is, I think, is evident. Um, now, I don't know whether I agree with you, but probably we both imply um, that certainly the idea of an unconcealment of being in Heidegger, he calls it event of truth, yeah, is definitely not that all of a sudden things become evident and now we have finally solved the question. I mean, what he means by unconcealment of being are epiphanic situations situations where for a short moment, in whichever way you want to describe that, something becomes evident. Um, now, I don't know whether we agree on this one still. I'm, I'm curious for your, for your moment. But I do think, uh, and if you don't think that, I'm not saying that I have the right interpretation, then we disagree here. I do think that the possibility for an epiphanic event of truth stays open in his philosophy uh, till the end. 
And I think this despair of only a God can help us is precisely becomes more and more pessimistic that this will not happen. What I do not think, and this is where we definitely disagree once again, I mean, I try to elaborate, I mean, I think this is always a productive way to elaborate where one can agree to disagree, is that, that there is any dimension of history in the sense of history, capital H, in Heidegger. See, I think uh, that history of being, Seinsgeschichte, capital B, I mean, he uses the word of history, but it has absolutely nothing to do with historicity in the sense that you could predict when. I mean, history of being means that there were certain moments in the past where, I mean, I'm not even saying that makes a lot of sense, but this is what Heidegger seems to imply, where unconceivement of being was more likely than in others. So ancient Greece, for him, of course, I mean, this is the German projection. This was a time, 5th century BC, where unconceivement of being was likely. And he does seem to imply that his own time, and this is what he writes in Introduction to Metaphysics, and first he thinks that's maybe the new German government, and then he quickly falls out of grace. And then I think he opts on technology, that there is a certain potential for unconceivement of being to happen. But we, this, these are my words, we don't find the right angle for this to happen. We don't find the right angle for this to happen. And as this is our Schuld, what we owe to being capital B, as this is our Schuld, the situation, the less we achieve for this to happen, the more precarious the situation becomes. So I think we seem to disagree in the sense that you are saying there is no possibility for unconceivement of being to happen. I would not only claim there is a possibility to happen, there's also a possibility for that to happen and for it to be the ultimate destruction. Yeah? I mean, so un I mean we always associate when the ultimate evidence comes to the fore, that's good for everybody. No. The ultimate evidence could precisely be a cosmological evidence in the way uh, in which we realize that uh, you know, the existence of humankind has always been a marginal cosmological side product that can disappear anywhere, any day. I mean, like dinosaurs have disappeared. <laughs> like our entire planet and galaxy might disappear. Okay, I mean, now I'm projecting into science, but I think the possibility for unconceivable of being in the positive and the negative sense is there in Heidegger's late philosophy. But now I would like to hear you where we exactly disagree. <coughs> I, I don't think I'll take up the time. Don't want to? Oh, I'm no, no, I'm, I'm really interested. I'm sure there's a lot of people who Briefly. Have uh, <laughs> Let me know what the main disagreement would be. I was planning to just okay. go. Uh, yeah, okay. Then. I'll, I'll say one mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, Sorry. good. Thank you. So um, I guess the difference is that um, you talk about being an unconcealment, not so much about concealment. Mm -hmm. And Heidegger is in the later work. No, that, that I agree with you. Sorry, I forgot to say. Concealment okay. is very important. What he's order. interested in is truth, which is both. Mm -hmm. Truthing, mm -hmm. which is a process of coming to deconcealment, which mm -hmm. always hides things. Mm -hmm. There's always things that mm -hmm. are not out there. Yes. Um, and that he sees there, there being no ultimate moment in this. So it's certainly, a, there is certainly, you know, a world at some moment. But this world is subject to, and Koselleck reads this as crisis. It's a crisis and it switches around and what was concealed emerges. But he doesn't see there being any, um, maybe it's not epiphanic because it's not, mom it's certainly phanic but it's not theophanic, so there's no end. There's no final end to okay. it. And my only comment was yeah. that it seemed to me like you were placing some hopes for the positive side of Heidegger in something that might come once and for all. But no, I think you've already no, answered. No, all of a sudden, I'm sorry we agree too much. I mean, I mean you, you obliged me to, 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 to say more precisely what I wanted to say. Uh. We seem to agree now that there is a moment for fanic. I mean, there's a possibility for, I mean, we agree on the concealment. That is very important, but you know, as always, I have the cues of time. I mean, I was using a lot of time anyway. So there's a possibility for, uh, for a fanic moment. There is a huge importance of concealment. And I did not necessarily want to say that the fanic moment will be something wonderful and productive. Yeah? Uh, you know, it could also be that, uh, I mean, let's say this quantum computer thing will work. I find this interesting, in this situation, at least that there's this hope. Yeah? you know, they might reveal something that is completely <laughs> existentially unbearable. 
Yeah? So in the sense that it would be fanic, we can only bear it for one moment that would then rather dump uh, all quantum computers. I'm not saying, oh, once we know, it's going to be great. No, this is absolutely not an implication of progress. Or <laughs> See, I'm, I'd love to hear more about Wittgenstein and, and Heidegger in particular, but I'm going to actually move the question in a A little bit discussion. louder, because I hardly hear it. I'm going to move the discussion so in a different direction, yeah? which is to come back to the point that you made at the end of the talk about um, the Macintosh uh, visualized operating system. And I mean, I think it's an absolutely wonderful point that you're making that there's a real a oh, decision. Oh, I'm really relieved. That I thought you would now say yeah. how horrible that <laughs> was. <laughs> a wow. decision that was made in a way to configure our experience of computers in a way that's almost like something that was read for out of Heidegger, this sort of um, uh, a, a kind of umsichtigkeit that um, you experience visually. I mean, I, um, but at the same time, it seems like there's also a completely different aspect of the experience of using computers, which is this entire world that, you know, if I could appropriate your world, um, this word of latency is completely latent, is completely yeah. hidden that you, you can hack into, that you can have this sort of mysterious access to, that some people are privy to if they can code or they can program, and other people are completely oblivious to. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how that tension plays out. And maybe to come back, I mean, it's a terrible thing when someone says that something's not interesting to think about how it <laughs> might be interesting. But with the question of the National Security Administration, it seems like part of what is so uncanny and disturbing about this sort of regime of surveillance <coughs> is on the one hand, it's a system of surveillance that in a way, unlike the Panopticon, is completely hidden from us, that's sort of inscrutable, that we can't really ourselves ever take in as a whole. But at the same time, it's a system of surveillance that is on the one hand latent, but at the same time promises to turn everything we do into say into a kind of juridical evidence. So. Yeah, I don't quite know. This is just reacting to what you ended up saying. Why I have such a weakish and weak reaction to uh, the surveillance? I mean, maybe I'm, I'm absolutely not surprised by it. I also have no national pride of thinking this is exclusive to the U.S. I mean, uh, you know, there's. I mean, if you can read German in today's uh, issue of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, there is a very, very interesting of the n article by the next speaker of the next speaker in this lecture series by Peter Gallison. And Gallison say it cost you something like $2.5 million uh, to establish a quite powerful system of surveillance. So the state has to invest that. It is nothing. It's peanuts. So I mean, it's hard to imagine that there's any state in the world uh, with some state power, a little bit stronger than, say, Liberia or something like that, that has not established such a system. And then, of course, uh, you know, I ironically think then they're obliged to oblige themselves to read everything and to spend money for that, uh, all the emails that I'm ever producing. And, and I, I'm not surprised by that. So I, I, I don't, th this is a little bit for me like, I do not see where there, it's, it's very bad, we agree on that. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not, not trying to defend that. I just don't see where there is the qualitative difference. Huh? I mean, I think this is, a dramatic technological improvement of the possibilities of surveillance, but uh, I would only see a difference to a degree. Um, the question that interests me, and that is Heidegger inspired, I don't even know, um, I wouldn't claim 100% hermeneutically Heidegger meant that, I do believe he did, but is nevertheless the question, uh, is there a fanic, I like fanic instead of epiphanic, is there a fanic potential in this latest technology? Yeah, I think um, the way we discuss about it is always, I mean, this is the commercials and uh, some people are very optimistic. You praise the infinite possibilities and what not. I mean, this is very much what the digital humanities do, you know. I mean, the, the, the those people have now made it their profession to be in favor of the digital humanities, all be fantastic, or one is very, very pessimistic, and oh, this is the end of liberal democracy, and so forth, and so forth. And my, my fascination, my interest, uh, and I do think it is the intellectual challenge of our present, of our time, is neither nor. Uh, I'm really interested, 
in the question to phrase it in the Heideggerian way, where there's a fanic potential, where there's something in this environment that is emerging, and I think that is not only emerging under the control of Apple and Google and so forth, there's also something emerging that once it is emerged, Google cannot control. Where there's something uh, in here and there um, that would produce moments of evidence, uh, that would produce evidence, that would produce a short moment of seeing something that, seeing something, feeling something that you haven't seen before. So I'm interested in this possibility. Um, and I mean, what I've been presenting here about the Steve Jobs, um, this, is not, this is not my first approach. I mean, this is trying to think that through. I mean, it is interesting uh, that you think that the entire Apple equipment really becomes like an illustration um, of the ready to hand. I mean, you li literally, the world is ready to hand if you have that kind of device. Yeah. Uh, so would that ready to hand then uh, be a ready to hand that would be more, that would produce uh, an event of truth? No, I think it is actually a ready to hand that leads you into a different kind of constructivism, yeah? into a different, I mean, to use uh, Mr. Schumann's language and Wittgenstein's language, it basically leads you into a language game that is now electronically based. Yeah? I mean, for those of you who, who know him, I think that is quite... Uh, interesting in the very early writings of Friedrich Kittler, I mean, who was in love with these uh, computers that still looked like uh, tape recorders, and these very old computers and where everything was dark, but there was this, this expectation that something would show itself in this technology. And uh, this expectation or this challenge, I'm not saying I can prove there's something, but, but to see whether something is happening there, that, that fascinates me. Thank you for that talk. And maybe the moment that sort of um, bridges some things, that moment of unconcealment, is uh, exactly the moment when, when Heidegger in Die Frage nach der Technik um, quotes Hölderlin, mm -hmm. that, um, wo die Gefahr ist, da ist das Rettende auch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and then maybe to, uh, to sort of to, to bridge or just to, um, to construct an affinity. So maybe there is an affinity between your son, the fighter pilot, and the early Friedrich Kittler. Because what they there is actually one. <laughs> because yeah. what they um, what they are doing, or in Kittler's case, what he has been doing, is exactly the opposite of the Apple approach. Kittler, being the so-called philosopher with the soldering iron, being the one who dismantled his computers, who actually trained himself not only to use them in the way that an Apple user would use his own Apple, but also being able to reconstruct it. And your son, the fighter pilot, um, being actually trained to handle this machine and not only to experience it, but experience it in a trained way and therefore maybe experiencing that one moment, that equitemporal moment that Heidegger is all about. I don't yeah, I mean, we can, I mean, if uh, we could talk anecdotally about the relationship between my late friend Friedrich Kittler and my uh, oldest son, Marco Gumbrecht, who now may have to fly, so uh, he's in the German Air Force, so may have to fly surveillance in the Baltic countries. That is actually my personal take on the political situation. You know, the, uh, the NATO and especially the German Air Force will now do the A surveillance of the Baltic countries, which all of a sudden becomes a strategical necessity. Anyway, um, now, the point I want to make about, about Friedrich Kittler, whose work fascinates me, and I don't know how many of you know the work of Kittler. Not too many, or are you so tired that you cannot... Uh, I mean, then just a short word. I mean, biographically speaking, I mean, Friedrich was actively... Uh, um, how would I describe it? I mean, he had a phobia with the entire Apple screen, mouse, and so forth, and so forth. I mean, Friedrich was in love with these computers that looked like old tape recorders and was in love with this dark situation where only very few people were able to write programs and so forth and so forth. Now, that is historically interesting, but I find it is very archaeological. I mean, uh, I think in a way, in the way in which this electronic industry has really transformed our life situations, uh, 
is of course the Apple screen and the mouse and so forth and so forth. I mean, in that sense, it has completely transformed our everyday. Uh, it has completely transformed our way of communicating. Imagine if everybody uh, who needs to or wants to use email today, this would have been Friedrich Stream, first has to write the program and would only have a right to the access. If you, you know, I, cannot, I, ca I can hardly get going my Wi-Fi access at a hotel. I mean, program would be... So I think this is interesting as a influence by Heidegger early stage of asking this question. But I think uh, Friedrich Kittler died actually still believing that uh, the Lötkolb would be the access to the philosophical question. And I think that is just, I mean, I love the guy and admire the guy. This is why I did this book I did at Zurkamp. This is intellectual kitsch almost. Yeah? I mean, and this is why late in his life was he was concentrating very productively on classical antiquity because he had a phobia with this Apple situation. Now, whether you like it or not, um, you know, it seems to be the state is this. Yeah? I mean, it's the next generation of the iPad pod and so forth and so forth and phone. And at the same time, quantum computers. Not that I know much about it, but I think this is, this is uh, where the present is. And now I'll come back to concealment. I mean, this seems to be the dramatic situation there. The longer that the fanic moment, unconcealment is not happening, the more it's being concealed and the more precarious, the more precarious the situation is. And I think this is the, 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 the existential situation where I think there are more and more questions of survival. Can we survive? Can we survive? What, what will come out of that? Yeah? This seems to be the Stimmung that is being produced uh, by this constant pr production of latency. Yeah? And once again, I mean, this is uh, how I understand in a, in a much earlier technological situation, this kind of only a god can help us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's, it's fairly easy nowadays to, to literally jailbreak, that's, that's the name of the process, to, mm -hmm. jailbra to jailbreak your, your Apple device just by looking at videos where 10-year-olds on YouTube tell you how to do that. And that is an, a fanic moment where you actually start to gain to gain control over your device in a way that you hadn't before. So I think, yes, maybe the soldering iron might be the wrong metaphor, but let's say um, technologic literacy might be one way of gaining these fanic moments. Yeah, I listen to, I mean, I listen that, I register that, and I will think about it. Yeah? I mean, I'm just, you know, if I now, I mean, I was asked in the, in the seminar what I had to say about cheddar, and then I thought I should avoid it myself. And I would now engage with you in this discussion. I just don't know much about it, but it sounds interesting. Um, I, I was listening to to your talk tonight. Um, I was thinking that um, I was thinking about the term of the situations of latency, and. Um, um, from reading your book after 1940, 1945, I had certainly associated it much more with a particular historical political situation after 1945 and um, less looked at, so to speak, the conceptual side or the, con the conceptual design of it. Um, now, the way you described it, um, um, you know that there is that there is something there, but you, you are not able to pinpoint it, you are not, not able to identify it. Um, that seemed to me also to open the possibility to think of a situation of latency as um, a situation of familiarity in the sense of, uh, yes, you know there is something, and, and you, but you can, it, it's so familiar to you that you cannot, cannot tell what is, familiar to you, that's what it makes familiar to you. And if that's the case, then in a certain way, uh, it seems that a situation of latency is in a way the structure of the, of the notion of what Husserl calls the natural world or the, or the life world, which is always, which is indubitably there for you in the very sense that you can, can't point to what is mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. what is there. So, and that, if that's somehow right, that this category itself mm 
so to speak, propels us into um, something like the Husserlian early 20th century world, it seems that the, the question of um, evidence, so to speak, migrates from this chasing for evidence through epistemological maneuvers into a realm where um, there is always already um, evidence and too much evidence, uh, with the exception that, that Husserl never would call it evidence as far as I know. He, he speaks of it as indubitable, um, not questionable, there is no question about it, and that's exactly what, what, it, makes, what it makes the life world. And uh, I think for Husserl, then, evidence is, a, in a certain way, a teleological term. He wants to construct tele uh, uh, evidence as a scientific, uh, still as a scientific sure. uh, gain or something which is accomplished by, uh, by science. But that also means that he never, what one could think, that he never would think of identifying the evidence uh, achieved through science as, so to speak, regaining what has been the familiarity with the world. So these two sides of not doubting in something never coincide uh, in Husserl. So science has, ha if science is the telos of the world, it's not in reconstituting our, something like our familiarity with, with the world. And it seems that uh, first that, uh, if that's something somehow uh, coherent with what you were saying, uh, that's saying that that reshapes at least the whole debate about uh, s uh, evidence as compared to everything before or the 20th yeah, century. No, that, is, that is interesting because, um, see, I haven't made a distinction, but this is once again, I mean, because I cannot say everything in one talk, uh, between the very, la the very late Husserl uh, and right. this reflection about Wissenschaft uh, and the Husserl reception. I mean, I think, I mean, the Husserl reception, not in the sense of a direct reading of Husserl, uh, but I think what is the most powerful in the sense of quantitatively representative um, result coming out of Husserl via Alfred Schütz and so forth and so forth is what I call constructivism. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not right. randomly that the word constructivism comes from the very successful book by Berger and Bluckman social construction of reality, and that indeed they both were students of Alfred Schütz at the New School in New York. So now, this is absolutely not what Husserl wanted. And this is not what Husserl wanted when he tried in the 20s to, to, to reconstruct a transcendental subject. Of course, the idea, I would describe the, the not the Husserlian project, but Husserl's project, um, metaphorically speaking like this. So if you can exactly reconstruct by introspection what is going on in the human mind. And if you hold this against how the world appears in our mind and subtract, so to speak, uh, the effect of the human mind in constituting intentional objects, by this operation of subtraction, I mean, they never calls it this way, uh, you can produce a way of evidence. And I would say that um, Beside, below, or beyond uh, constructivism and relatively, I think, banal reception histories of the investigations Wittgenstein, uh, there is a certain type of very patient phenomenology. Uh, we talked to the this Lambert Wiesing, for example. Yeah, I mean, where you, you, you approach relatively small problems, but it is actually to point to something uh, that are still pursuing that and are thereby cultivating, um, let me call it, a culture of evidence that is much less dramatic or melodramatic than the Heideggerian yeah. culture of evidence. That matters to me, sure. but it is much more patient, right? And, and so, okay, this will not be, you know, about humanity surviving, but about what is going on in the school class when you point to something. <laughs> yeah? And I think uh, there is a certain survival in the present philosophical situation, maybe even an increase, uh, partly also to talk about institutional politics and politics of university, because there is a, 
If you put it this way, at American universities, there is a potential relation of tolerance between the dominant analytic philosophy and that type of phenomenology. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because as they are very patient, they're very careful with their definitions, and so, so they pass the, the filter and the control of analytic philosophy. And I see a tendency in our philosophy department run about Yale. Yeah, somebody like Wiesing would all of a sudden be interesting. Yeah? And that is interesting because I do think this is maintaining the hope of evidence in a way that is much less dramatic than the Heideggerian one. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I'm too much in love with this dramatic way. Late in life. Do you sound like being at this point where you don't know whether, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm interested in any further questions. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very interesting. And um, I actually, uh, I was wondering if I should ask this question now because it's still about Heidegger. Even before you ask it, I think you should. <laughs> and um, there is, uh, with, there's one, th first of all, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that in Heidegger there is a topic at center stage, which is the thing in itself. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, would probably phrase it a little different. I would think mm -hmm. that even in being in time, we could see that this is the actual question. Oh, yeah, th th that I agree. This is what he starts out. And I think that he falls so much in love with uh, being in the world and with ready to hand that he doesn't really lose it, but in the reading. Yeah? So I, I agree with you. That, is, that, that informs being in time and that continues to be his project. But this unbelievable success within a few months of, of, of being in time mm. that made him really with the one and only book he ever wrote into the most widely read philosopher, that is a different reading. So if I am sympathetic to that, then there is still, in your take on Heidegger, one thing that I have trouble with, and that concerns your idea of presence and mm -hmm. the idea that the way that you perceive of evidence still seems to be within the framework of perception somehow. Mm -hmm. This is also how you juxtaposed mm -hmm. it to the Cartesian. Mm -hmm paradigm. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that even though I would totally agree with you in terms of Dasein being a term to substitute mm -hmm. the subject and also to include the body again, mm -hmm. it seems very important that there is no central apparatus anywhere in Heidegger. So it seems that sensibility is the one thing that for Heidegger would not give you a route to evidence at all. So what I want to, what I want to say mm. with, with regard to the last mm sort of uh, conversations you had mm -hmm. is that w wouldn't your question be when is evidence and somebody like Heidegger would say well evidence is maybe in the technologies that we may invent or that we might discover but it's never to be understood as something in the frame of mind of perception where I, I would say something like I see that this is true where this would be the the misconception where Heidegger would say no maybe the time of evidence is where so one would have to accept that evidence maybe is, for example, if we are able to um, determine the atomic, the atomic structure, structure of iron, then this would be an incident of evidence. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, you no, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, let me just concentrate on the moment I'm saying there is no perceptual apparatus in Heidegger. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, there's no, no such systematic thing. I mean, my, my image of Heidegger, so to speak, uh, is a result of taking certain words that appear in him, and I've always been read as metonymical or metaphorical, uh, literally, seriously. Not f to give you an example, um, uh, in uh, what is called thinking, for example. So there's this question, so if unconceivable of truth ever happened, uh, what, what should the Dasein, how should Dasein react? Yeah, and then he literally says, I mean, I'm saying the German word, the verb umarmen. Uh, I mean, now, I tend to take that seriously, not umarmen in the loving <laughs> sense of loving umarmung, but, but really in the sense of um, establishing a physical relationship with that, yeah, a position with that. Um, and in that sense, um, 
or in the sense he writes about uh, about uh, uh, dwelling uh, and constructing, for example. Yeah, in that sense, I feel in this dwelling situation, for example, this is about the unconceivable would be to get the place where you built the house right. Yeah? So, I, to my knowledge, I didn't know about Frank Lloyd Wright, but this kind of Frank Lloyd Wright type of architecture, you sometimes think he exactly got it right. This is, this is where the house has to be. There's actually one Frank Lloyd Wright house in Stanford campus. And it's absolutely amazing. It's not the greatest building, but where it is exactly put, yeah, what the site is. And uh, you see that, and you feel you cannot argue. I mean, these are effects. So, so get my point. I mean it. I mean it in this very in, in this very sense. So, and let me argue why I see it this way. Uh, because I would claim, whether Heidegger meant that or not, unless you read him this way, it's not worth reading him. I mean, if you don't read him in this way, then he will be ultimately a precursor of Gadamer. I mean, that would not be the worst thing in terms of personal relationships in the world, but that already exists. So, I, I mean, I have an intellectual epistemological interest in opting for a non-hermeneutic Gadamer. Now, not because I think that hermeneutic is something specifically evil, but because I think that is, I mean, I was just saying in the seminar today, that is already highly developed in a very sophisticated way. Whereas on this other side, yeah, uh, we have to gain something, but uh, I will certainly, after the discussion today, realize I mean, what you were saying about this other type of patient, that, that call him patient phenomenology, and what you were saying that is an interesting option, of course, to say, no, this is not something deep that has to be produced. Uh, it happens in the moment when we when we have this atomic structure. Yeah? I mean, what makes me doubt uh, that he would completely agree with you, but that is ultimately not important whether he would agree or not, but is this constant critique that goes to the very end of the mathematization of science, of Newtonian science. Eh? I mean, if there was a way of producing an evidence about the atomic structure that would not be mathematical nor by visualization. Um, then would come close. I mean, for me, this 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 example about the about energy and 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 sitting in a in F tw in M in an F whatever twenty four or so that 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 sounds interesting. I mean, not that not that I think that's the end, but this is what drives my question about electronic technology. Yeah? But um, I think the reason we are going that it should not perhaps be something in the dimension of surface depth, something where I take the unconcealment, this event of unconcealment too seriously, that is quite serious. And that perhaps is best in the architecture essays. And there is no, there is no unconcealment uh, of um, the Wohnen. No, there is, you have to find the right place. And once you find the right place, you are there. And the question disappears. I mean, the question of where you should go, if, if you're in the right place, then you are in the right place. Is, is that clear what I mean? I mean, this, this would be an evidence without this duplicity and an evidence that at the same time would not be a mathematical one. I, I don't mind. I mean, I'm very grateful. Discussions are so uh, determined-oriented. I, I, I want to bring, uh, I wanna bring so. uh, France to the table. So thank you very much for the talk. And uh, um, uh, my question has to do, thank you very much for bringing back to the table, Diderot and all that tradition and link that to the, to the present. My question has to do with the, the grand narrative of the, what you call the historicist um, mm -hmm. um, worldview, uh, chronotype. Uh, mm -hmm. That, well, first of all, uh, I, I happen to be teaching Foucault and I, so the, for my first question is how much of it is different from essentially what Foucault says in the Les Moelles Shows in the, in the sense that you know the 19th century, that change of epistemy, you know we're no longer in the classical age. We're no longer about the classification of things, but we're moving into the narration of history. It's everything is about a representation, mm -hmm. representation. So you know he talks about biology and history and linguistics. Mm -hmm. So it's all about history. But I ask that question because 
there's a there's a second question is that um is that how much of it, how much of that you know if you look at 19th century because if you look at Foucault when when he discusses these disciplines he's really looking at dominant scientific discourses sure. and how much of that kind of larger narrative of change of epistemy leaves out you know the 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 presence of or latency mm. or it's actually it's in 19th century at least in France it has fallen simply into literature. It's all mm -hmm. in literature, the objects, the mm -hmm. sensations, mm -hmm. and um, and that brings to a, a more general question, which is if you look at people at Di like Diderot, mm -hmm. Diderot, it's Le Neveu de Maramo or Jacques Le Fataliste. It's either, it's either it's both literature and philosophy, except in the 19th century the two domains have have become apart simply and and. For Foucault, I mean, if we, if we follow uh, Foucault's tradition, he's looking at dominant discourses and scientific discourses, but how much of that kind of change of epistemy is simply a separation of disciplines? I mean, let me give you two answers in the way I, I see myself in relation to uh, Foucault. That doesn't take care of your uh, entire question. I mean, and actually, this would be two convergences. I mean, I, I mean also don't try to, to be specifically Foucauldian or not. I mean, yes, uh, I, well, let me, let me start by saying this. And uh, I mean, I think he cannot be overestimated as one of the grand historians of the 20th century. And he's constantly overestimated as a philosopher. I mean, what he does as a philosopher uh, does not go far beyond what German phenomenology of the 1920s, people like Max Scheler and so forth were doing. But as a historian, and that's what we're talking about, and to use it in the traditional way as a historian of ideas, uh, I mean, his chair in the Collège de France, that is very interesting, you know, because the professor at the Collège de France defined their own chair, and his chair was uh, La Chair des système de pensée. Yeah? So as a historian of systems of thinking, he was certainly very, very important. Now, um, the first reaction is that, I mean, not unlike myself or myself like uh, Foucault, uh, in this narrative of the emergence of the historicist chronotope, I, of I mean, of course, but what I'm doing is to try to describe uh, what becomes centrally established in the 19th century at the university and partly due to the university um, in whatever you want to characterize 19th century society as, I mean, capitalist society, bourgeois society, and so forth. But I mean, I would say that this historicization, that evolutionism uh, and philosophy of history, not in the sense that everybody read Hegel, but this way of thinking about reality is centrally institutionalized. Now, uh, there are, of course, uh, lots of other discourses that are there that Foucault doesn't pay much attention to, that I don't pay much attention to. But I don't think this is illegitimate, A, because you cannot talk about everything at the same time, but also, I mean, the question is really what is centrally established? Yeah? I mean, of course, this entire prose of the world tradition that somehow has its own reception history. It was also never repressed, you know. Uh, there have always been readers of Diderot. There have not been many readers of Lichten, uh, Lichtenberg until, I would say, the late 20th century. But, but nevertheless, there is a reception history. So my second point, and this is, I mean, you didn't mention that, but maybe we agree on that. Um, this is where I find Foucault particularly interesting. Let me start by Kozelek, whom most of you are certainly less familiar with. But let me put it this way. I don't think that any historian, intellectual historian, historian of ideas has contributed more in a more beautiful way than Koselek, who like Heidegger doesn't have one central book, but in his life wrote to the historicization of the historicist chronotope. I mean, the historisierung des historischen Weltbilds, I mean, this is what practically everything has ever done. Interestingly enough, although that seems to be the obvious question, until uh, his death, there was a very long interview in the FAZ a couple of days before he died with Jaismann, uh, 
And yeah, I just want to ask, so, I mean, in other words, but what do you think will now follow? What's come yet? So after. And Kozelek doesn't get the question. Yeah? So this is very strange, get my point. I mean, so you historicize something all your life, and, and the question what could follow after that is not, maybe that's being a German professor who never left Germany, but no, I shouldn't say that, because on top of admiring him a lot, I liked him a lot. Now, this is interesting about Foucault. And I'm now referring to this very, very famous and overquoted, but nevertheless fascinating last paragraph, famous last paragraph of Les Moines Les Choses, you know, uh, where he's saying, so the silhouette, the contours of, we have to supplement our concept of the human is much more historical than we think. I mean, it comes out, I would say, of early 19th century historicism. But one day it will be washed away uh, like something we design into the sand at a beach. Right? A very famous quote. So he doesn't say what will come, but this book ends on the question, what could be uh, the next chronotrope, so to speak? What could be the next worldview? And in a certain way, and admiring Foucault a lot, I mean, what I've been working on the past decade or decade and a half, I mean, this uh, uh, Our Broad Present, this uh, book about p after 1945, is an attempt uh, to react to this question. Of course, not in the sense that I'm more powerful than Foucault, although I think one should try to be better than Foucault. I mean, why would one be in the profession if you don't try to be better than the best? I mean, not that I think I am, but, but, but anyway, but because um, I think not only our epistemological situation, but above all our epistemological situation has dramatically changed since 1966, which was the year of publication of Le Moyen Le Chaux, so that I think it makes sense to kind of try and cash in on this Foucault question. So I was reacting to your question in this sense because if you ask me about the importance of Foucault, I feel it is especially in this and in his other books that this question always comes up at the end. Yeah? This kind of beyond his present situation. And in that sense, all of a sudden, I think he is, well, he always wanted to be Nietzschean. He's very little Hegelian. Yeah? I mean, he does not understand or misunderstand his own situation as the Chilos. So that's where we are. Maybe that's the problem in Kozelek. But, but this now, uh, of course, something different will come, and we cannot see what that is. Uh, so. Again, what I've been doing, uh, the way I've been ending uh, the third part and, and the final part tonight is, so to speak, not necessarily a reaction to Foucault's question, but a reaction to that structure, to that kind of question. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for being so generous in on two planes and two directions sharing your ongoing work with us, <laughs> the direction it's taking, and helping us with our questions, which you didn't have to care about. Thank you very much for this but great I do care. <laughs>